Hello, hello everyone, this is Dr. Hefe, and Paradox has just released their 1.1.0 patch notes for Crusader Kings 3, and it looks like there's going to be a lot of significant changes. I'll put a link to the original notes in the description below, but what I've done is copy it over into Google Docs, read through all 34 pages, and decided to highlight some of the changes that I find more interesting. The less interesting ones will be in yellow and the most interesting ones will be in red. Now this comes from the perspective of a player who's spent most of their game time in Europe as a Catholic ruler. So what I find most interesting may be different from yours, but once we get to the end of this video, please let me know if there's any other major changes that I've missed. So let's get into it. Starting with game balance, one of the, you know, somewhat interesting change is building a new temple now gives much more piety. You can't do it too often anyways. So I've found that gaining a lot of piety is much more difficult than gaining a lot of prestige. So any change that allows you to gain more piety is of interest to me. Cities and temples now follow the same cost scale as castles. This is interesting in that your uh, lower vassals like mayors and bishops may not be able to improve their holdings as quickly so perhaps the amount of money and levies that you're gaining from those vassals will be slightly changed not sure if it'll have a huge impact so this is a you know a minor change a big change that i see is denying call to arms now costs fame potentially reducing your level of fame right now it just was an opinion malice and i thought they need to make a prestige cost to this. The, that has to be part of it. It depends, I think, you know, whether you're denying a defensive war or an offensive war. At least that's what the opinion malice will be. You can see it down here. But I think one of the biggest things is like now there's a prestige cost to it. You can't just ally people, call them into your wars, and then just say, no, I'm not going to help you out for free, basically. Uh, slash the opinion modifier from diplomacy by half. This could be pretty big. Uh, maybe it should be in yellow, but this seems pretty important. Diplomacy was a huge boost to your opinion, so like playing rulers with high diplomacy was pretty beneficial in keeping uh, vassals in line and from joining different liberty or independence factions. So these two are also pretty big changes. So for player cultures, culture head now updates within a month, as well as for player dynasties, the dynast now takes one month to update. So whenever my leader would die, basically because I had another dynasty member who was uh, the emperor of France, I was the emperor of uh, Britannia, they would always take over for like a year and spend the renown which, you know, the AI is supposed to keep spending in the legacy tree that you're following. But if I wanted to spread that renown around or maybe save some of it to disinherit some other heirs, it was really annoying that the Emperor of France would take it, you know, hold on to it for a certain amount of time and spend renown when it should have just gone back to me. I had way more armies than the Emperor of France. So having this update within a month rather than over a year is pretty strong. I, I really like that change. So these uh, these next changes are pretty much about uh, faith and heresy. So now the AI is demanding conversion of heretical vassals. That's pretty awesome. Uh, denying a conversion now gives a liege a revoke reason in addition to the imprisonment reason they already got. So this will help with zealous vassals who don't want to convert. Now you can not only throw them in prison, what I would do is i throw them in prison, wait for them to die, and hopefully their heir wouldn't be zealous. But now you can throw them in prison, revoke their title, and give it to someone of your faith. That's, that's a huge change, really beneficial. Heresiarchs will no longer accept demands of conversion. This is big for Catholic rulers because you often get Lollards as the heretics, and they still had an option to convert, so it could sometimes work out, but now it seems like you're just going to have to ask them to convert, they're not going to accept it, and then you're going to have to imprison and revoke their title. Outbreaks of heresy now increase the fervor of the affected faith much more positively. 
This means that large faiths are more likely to bounce back to max further after a heresy outbreak. Thank goodness. Catholicism, you're just dealing with heretics pretty much every 5 to 10 years. It's, I mean, I guess it somewhat makes sense, but it's kind of annoying to deal with. Thankfully, hopefully, there will be now some more time in between these heretical outbreaks. Uh, if a Vascal asks for something in return for you asking them to convert faith, denying the request no longer gives you an imprisonment revoke reason on them. So now, instead of you know asking them to convert, when they don't, you can just imprison them, maybe ransom them off, or now you can revoke their titles. Now you do have to pay them off. So think about that when asking vassals to convert. You may have to pay them out. Uh, not a big deal for rulers who have a lot of money, but could be an issue if you're hard up on cash or you have a lot of heretical vassals that you want to convert to your faith. All right, so these three changes, I think, strongly nerf the uh, abduct, 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 what does that even mean? Abduct scheme. So the maximum chance is now down to 85%. So now it's not like you're almost always going to work uh, be successful in your abduction schemes. It's practically impossible to abduct someone you're at, worth, at war with. So it seems like before what you could do is abduct someone, do a war against them, they're in your prison so automatically you get a hundred percent war score. Or if you're in a war and you abduct someone, you know, they're in your prison you get a hundred percent war score. So now it's going to be much harder to do that, much harder to abduct rulers, especially foreign rulers. So it kind of closes that loophole. It, it seems like a pretty cool one. I never did it myself, but unfortunately that, uh, that cheesy ability is now out of the game. So rebalance debts that it now comes in levels. The higher the level, the harsher the penalties. Penalties include levy reductions to make some severely indebted realms collapse easier. Now this was really annoying in my campaign when I would fight against the Damascusid Empire. Uh, basically the Muslim Empire that took over all of uh, the Middle East, Egypt, going through Africa. The ruler would always be like 1,000 to 10,000 gold in debt and still fielding armies of 40,000 guys. No problem. And this change means that now that ruler's empire is going to break apart. Hopefully the AI is better about handling money. I don't know how you go 10,000 gold into debt, but at least they'll be punished for it now. Vastly empowered the Mongol Empire's armies. Now you will truly learn to fear the horsemen of the steppe. Again, playing as a European ruler, I've never seen the Mongols get to Europe. They somehow fizzle out, so this will be an interesting change. The renown gained from alive dynasty members is now capped at two per month, 100 alive members. This is a huge change, especially to large empires. The idea of, you know, spreading your seed far and wide now means that you have to actually spread that seed outside of your own empire. Currently, uh, the, my empire Britannia has around 2,000 living members which it gives you a huge amount of renown, approximately like 40 renown per month. Going down to two per month means that, well, you're probably not going to be able to unlock all of the legacies. So this this is, you know, a beneficial change. I'm glad that I got to, you know, benefit from the ability to have tons of renown for pretty easy. But I think this will kind of force people to make, you know, more interesting choices choices of what they're going to do with their renown. Uh, this change to strong blood is also interesting. I you know, I thought the 40,000 was a bug. I mean, that meant that probably all of the members of your dynasty are getting really good genetic traits. And going down to 400% seems, you know, better, more more in line with what you would expect. Viking vassals are no, now more restricted when it comes to overseas conquests. This is huge for a European ruler. Starting at 866, you just see Swede, the Swedish rulers, I forget what their actual duchy title name is, but basically all of the Viking rulers are just expanding through Spain, Africa, like 
everywhere. They're basically just going everywhere. It's crazy. It's super frustrating to play with, as England because there's these hugely strong uh, Viking rulers and you're just trying to take some land in Ireland. But now you're dealing with someone who's a king of like different African nations. It's it's very difficult. So this will be a great change for any European ruler in the 866 start. Increased level of splendor gain from Dynasty of Many Crowns. I mean, this is a really difficult thing to do, so definitely going from 75 to 1,000 is huge, uh, especially with the nerf to how much renown you can gain from living members. Maximum penalty for being over your domain is now minus 100%. So this is for all those players who love the North Korea strategy. Unfortunately, it now looks like it's no longer doable. You're getting minus 100% and also your buildings will deactivate. Basically, completely removes the North Korea strategy from the game. So, sorry, it looks like a fun strat. It looks pretty cool, but it kind of makes sense to remove it. It's it's very cheesy strat. Let's look at the AI changes. Increased the AI willingness to spend on Dunchy Capital Buildings. Now, I've basically never seen the AI build Dutchy Capital Buildings, so this change will be pretty big. Also, haven't really seen AI building, you know, higher level forts. I think there's a change to it in here, but I can't find it again. So hopefully that change is also in there. Uh, <laughs> sternly told the AI that when it's trying to support the player, it shouldn't try to retreat just because the enemy is coming right at it. Yeah, there's been a number of times when I'm set up in like the mountains and I'm like all right this is a great defensive position allies come here you know all of us together we're going to defeat the enemy and then wh what is my allies doing they're running around not willing to support me or just running away from a fight so hopefully your ally AI will be better enemy AI could also use a boost but definitely it's much more frustrating when your ally AI is messed up than when the enemy AI is messed up AI is now more likely to create holy orders. It's less likely to do so the more holy orders of faith has. In my playthroughs, I'm the only guy who creates a holy order. It'll be interesting to see if the AI does create more holy orders. So, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to this change. <laughs> Again, Vikings should now mostly prefer to conquer contiguous areas overseas. Thank you. This is a great change. You know, seeing Vikings in Spain and Africa and like the Middle East and Russia, it's it was crazy. So I'm looking forward to this change. Uh, interface. Add a situation warning of when the vassal may leave your realm doing to inheriting a foreign title. This isn't a huge change. I mean, this only happened like once or twice in my playthroughs, but it's a good to note that it'll be there now. Some character filters, also interesting. Uh, warning suggestion for when they have too few wives. Yeah, that's that's good. I was kind of annoyed when I was losing piety and not realizing that that was because I didn't have enough wives. Allow left mouse drag in the dynasty tree. This makes the open dynasty tree button a little bit more useful, but I'm still scared that it's probably going to crash once you have a hundred living members or more. So a good change, but Hopefully they make you the ability to actually use the open dynasty tree uh, more useful. Uh, let's scroll down some more. Fixed mercenary troops not getting accounted for in the number of military strength breakdown. This was always annoying because I'd look at you know the war overview and it would look like I would crush this guy, but then when I click on the character, I realize that he's you know just got another two thousand soldiers from hiring as mercenaries and then that completely shifts how strong you are compared to your enemy and probably what your strategy is going to be in that war. So I'm really glad that they're now going to include mercenary troops in that breakdown. Uh, fixed realm will lose land when vassal dies alert. Uh, I'm hoping this has now fixed it when you have high crown authority or higher. Uh, this alert would keep popping up, and I don't think it ever actually fired, but hopefully that bug is fixed, or the UI is fixed. Everything should be fixed there, I'm hoping. Uh, fix the select beneficiary. 
um, on the send interaction button. So yeah, in Crusades, I was having a very difficult time because apparently you could only click right in the middle of the button. So, I mean, this is more of a personal thing, but I'm glad that they're fixing that. Uh, fixing some combat predictors. Uh, again, not quite sure how that's going to look in game, but better prediction of how battles is going to go is always useful. Uh, sometimes claiming marriage has no chance of children. Again, I always played as though I assumed that was a bug, but it's good to know that this bug has been fixed. Again, another change to combat odds. Always good for accurate combat odds. Uh, knights no longer have such a disproportionate effect on army quality levels. This is going to be good because sometimes, you know, you have super large armies and then just having a couple more knights boosts it from like normal to elite quality. And I think men at arms should have a, a larger impact because I think they have larger impact in battle. But, you know, instead of increasing men at arms, decreasing knights to uh, have not such huge impact will be better, I think. Especially, you know, just giving you at a glance a good idea of whether your army is going to defeat the other army you know, taking into account all the other factors like terrain and military leaders. Uh, let's keep scrolling down. So success chance and secrecy modifiers now not shown for discovered schemes. So this was a little bit of an exploit that you could look over the modifiers and it would say is like a counselor, you know, and give plus so much percent for the success chance or is spy master. And then you would know your spy master is plotting against you. So this, this is a good change, I think. Now get a notification in the lower right corner when a part of your realm gets sieged by someone you're hostile to. That's good because, I mean, when you're a large empire or maybe you're fighting someone who's far away, you may not always be aware that you're being sieged by someone and you're, you know, losing domain. So this is good. Good, good UI changes. Uh, let's see, art change, <laughs> fixed a large amount of portrait clipping issues. So yeah, hopefully you won't see breasts just like clipping through their chain mail or like arms just coming out of someone's stomach. That was, that was always strange. So yes, clipping issues being fixed is a, a nice change in the art. Uh, localization, this will be important for, uh, you know, if you're not playing this in, uh, suppose English uh, that it gets localized correctly to your region game content so this is changing some more aspects of the game modding is for people who are modding the game a lot of changes here database this is changing like where certain cultures are the rulers in certain areas uh, you know very interesting changes that I think you know you should look at but I'm not gonna highlight any of them because it's gonna be you know very localized to certain playthroughs, um, but still could be interesting to look through. It's not very long. As you can see, I just scrolled through it pretty quickly, but maybe like one to two pages. And it could be interesting if you're starting a new campaign um, or wanting to replay a campaign and seeing you know, some of the differences for uh, the, the, le the rulers that you're wanting to play as. So let's get to the bug fixes. Fix the mass ransom button being useful when the person we ransom can to cannot pay the gold. So we just click the button and it seems like people would just get ransomed off. Who knows whether you're getting paid or not. So always glad to know that, you know, buttons that are designed to make the game more fun and easier to play are working correctly. Uh, fix characters who change league, liege, not always getting properly updated. This could, for instance, lead to their liege's vassal limit usage not updating. So this would be really annoying. I've run into this a couple times when you do a holy war for a kingdom. You get like 20 different counties. I give all those counties to different people, then give the kingdom to someone. And yeah, I expect it to update that. No, I don't have, you know, 20 added vassals. I only have one added vassal, but the game would keep with for you know several months maybe to a year and i'd have to exit the game reload it i mean not huge because the game would update at some point but i mean it was, it was it was kind of frustrating a little bit annoying at the time fixed house and dynasty modifiers never expiring when they have an expiry date 
So this is uh, a huge change because you get these Crusader bonuses and it said they should expire, but they never did. So a uh, pretty big change for your dynasty and house uh, bonuses. Let's see, there's, I mean, there's so many bug fixes. Let's see, behavior in the achievements window. This is great if you're playing Iron Man. Hopefully all those achievements don't just keep popping up every time after you've already unlocked them. Let's see, if you promise to va a vassal to educate their child, they'll now be miffed if you try and return the child. This helps, uh, you know, re change that um, interaction where you can offer to educate a child, gain an opinion bonus, and then just get rid of that child without getting a negative opinion. Um, like they still wouldn't have the opinion bonus from you anymore, but you could offer to educate them, you know, gain a bonus for who knows, like during a faction time or, you know, your ruler dies and a new heir comes in. You just need that quick opinion bonus. Now there's at least some penalty for just switching quickly between educating child and not educating a child. Uh, next one, imprisoned AI rulers will now attempt to ransom themselves. This is useful, like, anything that makes the ransoming easier is great. Um, a lot of, like, local different effects. People are now less eager to marry people they are terrified of. So, this is like the one change that I've seen to Dread. I think Dread needs, like, a huge rework, but at least this part has been fixed, where they're... There is one downside of Dread, where now maybe people are less likely to marry you. But I, th I still think Dread is super strong. Probably needs a, a rework at some point. Uh, let's keep scrolling on down. Witches can now host a grand rite. So now you have a payoff for creating your Witches Coven. Uh, it was quite an ordeal for me to create the Witch Coven because... Every time I thought I'd have 60%, more people were getting born into my house. But I got it, and then, you know, you get some good modifiers, a health boost. But not being able to host a ground right kind of made that whole effort of creating a witch's coven kind of fall flat. So this is a pretty big change for me. And also, you're no longer malnourished and obese for life. So whenever I'd get the obese trait, I'd click on the decision button to, you know, try and lose weight. My character would be trying to lose weight for 40 years. Now, I'm not saying this isn't realistic, but if you have a button that allows you to try and lose weight, at least give me some events to, you know, if I get added stress for losing weight, okay, fine. But it's like you would get this malnourished or obese uh, malice to your health, and you just couldn't get rid of it. So I'm hoping that this bug fix works. It'll be, be great for having longer-lived rulers. Uh, again, some more changes and come down to the very end and I need to scroll it up over here. Vassals who agree to a conversion demand during a heresy outbreak can no longer immediately reconvert to the heresy. So this would be somewhat annoying as a Catholic ruler. You know, Catholic ruler, you're dealing with heresies all the time. You get the little pop-ups that say, your vassal has converted to the Lollard heresy. Click on them, demand conversion. Yeah, they, they demand. They love me for whatever reason. 100% agree to the, to the conversion. And then, you know, click the unpause button. Vassal has just, you know, reconverted to the Lollard her Heresy. It's like, what the heck happened? And of course, you can't demand conversion again because there's that cooldown between. So, an annoying bug. I'm glad that that's been changed. Um, yeah. So this has been my TLDR. It's still pretty long, but again, this has been a huge patch, a lot of updates. Uh, yeah, so let me know if there's any other big changes in 1.1.0 that I've missed. What are you looking forward to? What are you annoyed about? Just, just let me know what you think of the new patch. Uh, until next time, I hope you are enjoying the game, and remember to take care of yourself.